Hi, and welcome to the November episode of Spotlight on UNBC. My name is Rob Van Adricum. Coming up this month, highlights from UNBC's big quality of life conference and the announcement of a new research forest near Fort St. James. But coming up next, we'll profile a brand new UNBC program designed to meet the changing healthcare needs of Northern BC. Those stories and more are coming up on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for November 1996. Men and women from throughout this region believed in the idea of a university of the North. They worked hard and they succeeded. I can easily predict that these will be seen as the golden years of this university. You and I uh, have been involved in a process that was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You can value education and go elsewhere um, and get uh, the same information, but if you value what you get out of it as a person and your input into it, then UMBC is an awesome experience. I take pride in opening the university. And I wish you all, in whatever capacity you serve the cause of learning, a bright and successful future. If there's one story that gets front page exposure all over northern BC, it's probably health care. Think about what's happened over the past few years. Beds have closed in hospitals, and greater emphasis is being placed on local clinics and health units. UNBC and the College of New Caledonia are teaming up to develop a brand new nursing program that will meet the changing health care needs of northern BC. With the phasing out of nursing programs at all northern colleges, this joint UNBC-CNC program will be the only one north of Kamloops where students can enter the nursing profession. The key about this program is that it has a special focus. It has a special focus on um, northern nursing. It has a special focus on preparation of, of people to work in rural areas, rural and remote areas, to work with First Nations people, uh, to work in the community, and to work in the acute care kind of environment that we find in the north. But at the same time, it's a program that is going to be allowing them to get the skills needed to move anywhere in the world. The particular health care issues of the North were outlined during a news event to announce the new nursing program. For example, the teen birth rate, low birth weight, and the number of motor vehicle accidents are all higher in northern BC than the provincial average. In addition, mental health in rural areas can be affected by such things as high unemployment, cyclical work schedules, and the lack of early intervention and crisis management services. You need to know something about cancer, you need to know something about emergency, you need to know how to deliver a baby. Well, those are very, very different kinds of bodies of knowledge. And in order to provide good care, the people in the small rural and remote facilities need to have a smattering of each. Um, and some expertise in calling on their knowledge. And what we're hoping to do in this program is through a focus on the kinds of health care issues and the kinds of patient populations that we have here in the North, help students to really put context to all their knowledge. It's a practice-based program, so we're hoping to make in every course relevant, practical application of the knowledge. So we don't separate theory and practice. So we have that full integration all the time. The other key issue, and this is a, this is a big issue, is that we're going to have a focus on First Nations health. First Nations leaderships have, um, have stepped forward and, and, and have began to look at a lot of those issues. The Assembly of First Nations has identified HIV AIDS tuberculosis, diabetes, and suicide as critical health issues. In northern BC, these and other health issues are affected by often remote locations, 
unemployment and poor housing. Instead of health being brought to the community, communities are starting now to define their own health needs and to start taking control over their health. So that's say, a move in the right direction in that the, the health issues are really going to be looked at. They're going to be looked at individually in each community and communities are going to start to set up their own strategies to deal with those health issues. And so the training aspect is extremely important when we're looking at um, solving some of the difficulties and problems in health and addressing the needs. Still, the biggest health care employer in northern BC is Prince George Regional Hospital. And while students will learn about health issues in small communities, they will also be well grounded in acute care practice. Nursing is changing as health care is changing everywhere. And so the program should be able to produce nurses who are geared to the approach that we take to health care today, which is less hospital-based and more community-based. While we will still need to train nurses for hospitals because we'll always have a hospital like PGRH in the north, but this program will allow them to broaden the scope of practice, to, um, to be in tune with today's approach to health care, and I hope uh, will attract people from not just the north, but for people from outside as well, because I think we always need to fertilize with a broad perspective. The new nurse has to be pretty different in the future. Somebody who's holistic, somebody who's a self-starter, who is caring, sensitive and flexible, but also somebody who has a real good sound knowledge of, of culture, of health issues, of the dynamics of a community and the social aspects of a community. And uh, I think this, this program would prepare those, uh, those nurses to meet those challenges. Good health is one component of what we call having a good quality of life, but there are other factors too. Things like recreation, educational opportunities and mobility. Quality of life can seem like an impossible thing to measure. It seems like it can even change from day to day. But UNBC hosted a major international conference on quality of life recently. Sessions focused on how we can measure quality of life and whether it's getting better or worse. As long as we are hungry and have no uh, good housing, uh, there's a little need to talk about quality of life because it's evident what we should do. But if we have all these beautiful things, these nice universities, uh, uh, good roads, uh, sufficient to eat, then the question is what next? And there's this conference about. Ruth Veenhoven was one of about 130 people to attend the conference, which was organized by UNBC's Alex Michaelis. If you look at the, the stuff that, that several uh, candidate city councillors are saying and the mayor, mayor candidates are saying, the phrase quality of life has dropped right and left. I don't know if that would have happened um, if we hadn't highlighted this kind of stuff. Quality of life can be measured by taking into account, one, economic factors like salary and cost of living, two, social indicators like education and equality. And then the third way of measuring utility or quality of life is subjective well-being. And here we turn to the individuals, as the other speakers have said, and we ask them, how satisfied are you with your life? How happy are you? How much pleasure do you have in your life? Each of these three types of measures, I think, have distinct advantages and disadvantages. They're complementary to each other. The advantage of the subjective well-being indicators that others have talked about and that all emphasize are that they are the most democratic. Here we're asking the individuals, are you happy? We're not having academics, we're not having policymakers decide this is what society needs. It needs equality, it needs this, it needs that. We're not, we're not having economists add up things for people. Instead, we're asking the individuals themselves, are you happy, are you satisfied? That's the advantage, or a major advantage. A disadvantage, I think, to the subjective well-being indicators, from my point of view, and the reason we need the other types of indicators as well, is that happiness isn't the only kind of value. There are other values, as Johar said. There are values about equality, and I don't care if equality makes people happy or not, I still value it. 
So we have to have the other social indicators. Another disadvantage, and, and I'm sort of knocking down my own area here, with subjective well-being is that people are sometimes able to adapt to some very bad conditions. And people can be very adaptable. And we don't want to find out that people are happy despite the fact that they're quadriplegics. Quadriplegia is still a bad thing from another value viewpoint. As part of the overall conference, a panel discussion was held with local disabled people who talked about their quality of life issues. I guess in many respects that attitude and that, that mental toughness comes from, or it, it gets you to forget those, forces you to forget those things that you have no control over, get a hold of the things you do have some control over, and for God's sake do something about them. In um, the, the first 10 years, we uh, have spent discussing what quality of life really is and have tried a lot of measures and, in short, uh, a lot of fuss and a few good data. And now we are gradually getting good data, good pictures of quality of life in nations, good time trends. Uh, now we know fairly well how happy we are and whether we are getting any happier and why some countries are more happy than others. UNBC was an active participant in the Youth Exploring Science Camp held in conjunction with the Fraser Fort George Regional Museum in Prince George. The popular event was designed to expose young people to the fun side of science. We're dealing with 10 to 13 year olds here young kids who don't have a lot of experience and don't know a lot about science and you take them and you expose them to it. You expose them to it in a very positive and very fun fashion and they come away thinking, hey, science isn't so bad. This is also a camp of the mind and it's about thinking, about creating new problems, about asking the question why and then trying to find an answer. They're learning, they're also having a lot of fun at the same time. Um, we've had some really amazing comments from some of the campers who have been involved in the camp week. Um, one of them, usually it's in conversations at lunchtime or snack time that you actually find out how much they're picking up. Um, one of them decided to talk to us about physics and they'd been warned about not taking physics by their older brothers and sisters and after we talked to them they were like, yeah, I can handle physics, no problem. So they were all set going into grade 8 next year and they were looking forward to being able to do physics in future years. So there's been similar comments to that that really show that the kids are getting confidence out of it as well as specific knowledge. The kind of science is better than one in school because more activities would be. If you were to be, take carpentry, you could go read books on carpentry, but until you actually have a hammer and nail in your hand and you've got a piece of wood in front of you, you're not going to get anywhere. So the same thing's true in science. I mean, we can teach people in books, we can show them pictures and diagrams, we can explain things ad infinitum in a very technical sense. But until they actually get their hands on it and can actually try it themselves and say, hey, this experiment worked, just like the book said. Or look, I did this, and I did this, and when I did this other thing, well, it's not the same as these two. Hmm, there's a puzzle here. And then they start thinking about it, and they start thinking, gee, maybe I can solve this puzzle, and maybe I can figure out what's going on here. And that's what science is about. Science is about to know. It's to, it's to go and, and, and learn and to understand what's going on. And this is the first step, and you can't learn about what's going on by reading a book. You have to get in there and get your hands dirty. And this is the first step to get those kids to get their hands dirty. UNBC's Prince George campus is quickly becoming a popular venue for classical music. The entire season of the Prince George Concert Association is being held in the Canfor Theatre and the Prince George Symphony Orchestra is planning a unique concert for the atrium of the administration building. This is some of those beautiful space in the city for performing and, and if our plans go well, uh, we will be doing a Baroque show hopefully right here in the atrium in the uh, beginning of December. And uh, we're going to have candlelights and uh, 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 trumpet players playing on the balcony and uh, hopefully an audience on all the balconies, uh, side balconies here. It should be wonderful. We have a Classical Yours series which has turned out to be incredibly popular and uh, we sold out the last concert last year so we hope that maybe we can have all four concerts sell out in the Canfor Theatre. And the Canfor is a, 
a really lovely little space. We don't have many spaces in the city with just 300 seats, especially now with the theater down right now. Um, and the Canfor brings us, it makes our connection with the university uh, um, much more complete. And I, I think that connection is vitally important. Students and professors in the Faculty of Natural Resources and Environmental Studies now have a great place to learn about the wilderness firsthand. UNBC recently announced a 14,000 hectare research forest located near Fort St. James. And there's a good mix of forest types and conditions in that area. And the meaning of this uh, research forest to the university is that it will become a part, a vital part of its research and teaching program. And there will be demonstrations and an outdoor lo laboratory for forest science and resource management in the fullest sense, from wildlife uses, recreation, and particularly, I think, traditional Aboriginal uses will be studied along with all the other resource management issues. My feeling is that there will be a lot of research that will be done on the research forest, but that's only one component of the research forest. The other major component is education. And education from a research point of view includes graduate studies. But uh, part of the reason that we are so interested in our association with the First Nations, uh, the Klazan Nation in this regard, is that we see opportunities for education not only of our students but of their potential students. It will be a training ground as well as an educational base for people who have an interest in the resource area. And it's a chance for us to show the Clasden uh, young people what some of the potential opportunities are in natural resources and environmental studies. We as natives, we have things to offer too. When you get a bear den, you have things that the bear does that we can study within the cut area and hopefully it will help a lot of people, whites and natives. Hopefully get become accountants, foresters, whatever it takes to make a good forest management. One of the real values of the forest is that it's a land area that we will have control over. You know, the students who are doing laboratories in classes where they can just go up to the forest for the world, uh, site and um, do some soil studies or uh, take a look at some of the activities there, that's fine. Or they can go out to Elisa Lake and take a look at some of the activities there. Or they can go out to the model forest and take a look at some of the activities there. On the research forest, they will do some of the activities. They will help in some of the decision making that will relate to the management activities on the forest. And that's a very different experience for the students to have. It'll be a real managed forest, but the management that will take place on the forest will be experimental management. It'll be designed to answer questions and improve our capability of managing the forest in British Columbia. So it will be, in the sense that you described it, a model forest in that regard because it will have demonstration components. But the main function of the forest will be to take a look at uh, experimental management that will get us closer to uh, sustainable uh, ecosystem-based management in the province. Here's a sobering stat to remember as we enter the Christmas season. There are more food banks in Canada than McDonald's franchises, and they feed about 2.5 million people every year. Clearly, poverty and hunger are not only issues for the third world. It's happening in our communities and on our university campuses. UNBC hosted a public forum last month in recognition of World Food Day. If the port of Vancouver, where much of our food is imported, when you go to the grocery store and you look at what type of food is there, not, there's not a lot of local representation in terms of the produce and what you can choose from. If the port of Vancouver were to close, we would run out of food in two days. The consumer as well has become disassociated with where food comes from. When you ask children where food comes from, they think of meat coming in on plastic styrofoam or plates with, wrapped with plastic wrap, or that vegetables come in bags that are vacuum packed and sealed. Bread, bread comes sliced and bagged. It's magical, it just happens. So they've become disassociated with where food actually comes from. The objective in terms of the events we planned for this week was to raise awareness in the community about World Food Day and the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty and to get attention directed on local issues of poverty and hunger and welfare. And I think we've succeeded in that. 
More than 50 people attended the forum, which also featured a bread and water lunch. Information prepared for the event revealed the local situation. 13% of the Prince George population lives below the poverty line. That works out to about 9,000 people. People on welfare in northern BC are being asked to raise their children on uh, $3 per child per day, you know, for food and uh, transport, for clothing. I'm not quite sure how, how you get it across. You have to keep saying it, you have to keep talking about it. And that's actually the reality. And I think un unless local communities and local populations grasp this fact, there's not going to be the amount of pressure on local or provincial or federal politicians to actually address the issues. UNBC social work student Cindy Wells addressed the issue from a personal perspective. My husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis so we therefore now ended our two income earnings. And we also had a house fire which basically took away everything that we ever had. So with three growing kids, I had to go to welfare. Now all through this year, I, all I wanted to do was get my family off of welfare and to again have a living of some sort. So now I'm approaching the year that I get to graduate, <laughs> Yahoo. Um, I've even begun to hope of what a, a job is going to bring to my family. But I have eight years of memories that are going to be with me. Memories of how am I going to feed my kids. How can I tell them they can't have a new bike or they can't go to the pool. These memories have actually proven to be my motivators and have been what have got me through these four years of really hard work. And I don't think I've been lazy. I don't think I've been unworthy. I don't think I've been undeserving. And I don't think I'm a welfare bum. If you allow a whole segment of the population to grow up in inadequately nourished and uh, underfed and poorly motivated at school, all you're doing is actually creating very much more significant problems for the future. More than 600 people attended a free Thanksgiving dinner in Prince George before the St. Vincent de Paul Society actually ran out of food. Before the forum on local poverty, faculty and students staffed the lunch line at a local food bank. Welfare rates do need to go up. I mean, people do need jobs. Um, but I think we need, a, 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 we need debates. And I think one of the ways is actually to engage local communities and um, municipalities even though they may not necessarily always have the powers, I think at that level, if we begin owning our own problems in our own communities around issues like food security, for example, and welfare and jobs and employment, um, then I think we'll be on a better track to, um, uh, you know, to address the issues. The UNBC Environmental Planning Program recently received a big boost from the Canadian Institute of Planners. The CIP gave official recognition of the planning program, making UNBC's bachelor's degree offering only the second in Western Canada to receive that distinction. Former CIP president and Prince George City planner Peter Bludoff was on hand for the presentation. I think there's a lot of uh, universities that teach some planning courses, they teach geography or whatever. But I think the Canadian Institute of Planners recognizes those schools where we feel very confident that the school will generate a good planner that will give them the good rounded experience uh, that is necessary for them to, to work in our profession. And, and basically that's the recognition process that we go through. They're very few and far between compared to the number of universities that are in Canada. And they're largely uh, reserved for the universities where a special effort has been made and, and the special criteria have been met that will produce planners that we know will, uh, will guide our country as well as our cities into the next millennium. The recognition event was significant not only because it's a rare occurrence, it was significant as well because the CIP recognized a unique program. Leslie King is UNBC's Chair of Environmental Studies. This is not just the urban lower mainland that we're planning for. There's real different planning issues and problems here. In the southern cities and in the urban centers where most universities are located and therefore most planning programs are located, the problems are housing. How are we going to house all these people? 
how are we going to get them from their jobs to work in an increasingly congested urban environment? How are we going to provide the services and the infrastructure? The environment's forgotten because it becomes almost something that people forget about. The dependency on the environment is still there, of course, but it's not a part of people's daily lives. Here it is. It's very much a part of their lives and they're very dependent on it for everything, for their livelihoods, for their recreation, for everything. And as a result, this program cannot afford to forget the environment or the natural resources on which people depend. And so it's a much more holistic kind of program. It addresses the planning needs of communities as a whole for their economic development, for uh, determining their future in terms of the sustainability of that resource base. How can we use that to fulfill our needs without destroying it for the next generations? And that's really what this planning program is all about. I think this university is to be credited because of the speed and the recognition of the undergraduate program. The program just opened a couple of years ago and already it's recognized by the Canadian Institute of Planners as one of the professional schools in Canada. That doesn't happen very often and again I think it's largely due to the commitment of the faculty. It's uh, a commitment to the profession and in addition it's a commitment to the the overall community uh, and the scope of the community that, that we have. So I think it's a real feather in the hat of UNBC to achieve this. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. Next month, we'll have details on UNBC's innovative World Wide Web courses, and of course, we'll have our annual UNBC Christmas gift ideas. We'll see you again next month.